Hi, I'm Cindy Perlin. I'm the founder and CEO of the Alternative Pain Treatment Directory. And I'm here today with Roxana Sasu, who's a neurofeedback provider in the Los Angeles area. And we're going to be talking about neurofeedback treatment of chronic pain. So hi, Roxana. Thank you for joining me today. Hi, Cindy. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Great. So um, can you, so most people don't know anything about neurofeedback, what it is, what it does. So could you start by talking a little bit about what it is? So I look at neurofeedback as um, brain exercise feeling. Uh, it's like going to the gym, but for the brain and you put the brain on a treadmill and you work it out and you work out different parts of it, just like you would work out different groups of muscles and then things are shifting. The brain learns with this repeated training to better regulate, which then in turn will provide better functional role and more specific, um, you know, help with specific symptoms that we're working on. So it's a really, it's, it's non-invasive. Nothing goes into the brain. Um, there's no electrical current. I know there's this, this misconception that there might be some kind of um, current going in. No, absolutely not. What we're doing is we're monitoring the brain's activity in a certain area of the brain and we feed that back to the brain through a certain interface. So we're creating a loop between the brain and uh, the computer. And the signal that the brain is uh, producing is being then shown back, shown back um, through this interface, which can be a game or a movie, it doesn't really matter. But basically we're providing a mirror uh, in which the brain can see itself while it works out. And then the brain will try and correct what it sees. It will try and control what it sees. And what that does, it results in a state shift that leads to a more appropriate um, state of function. Mm -hmm. So could you more specifically uh, describe like what happens when a client comes into the office? So I should say that um, neurofeedback, generally speaking, um, works the same way. The principle is the same, but then there are different approaches out there. Our approach, my approach is uh, in the upper method, the infralow neurofeedback, which basically focuses on symptoms and the individual and specific individual symptoms of our clients. Um, and what I mean by that is, each individual comes in with a certain set of symptoms with a certain uh, clinical profile, but the manifestations of those symptoms are different from brain to brain, depending on who this brain is. And that makes our work so interesting and it makes our approach so specific and so individualized. Um, therefore, I think very, very effective. Uh, so what I do first when the client comes in is a sit down. We sit down and we discuss about all these different symptoms and how they manifest and uh, how long they've been there for. And we're talking about all the symptoms, not just symptoms related to pain, um, because I want the bigger context in which this pain occurs, right? Uh, whether it's chronic migraines or it's chronic nerve pain, uh, back pain, uh, fibromyalgia, uh, CRPS, it doesn't matter. I need the bigger context so that I understand how the brain is dysregulated, and then I'm going to be able to design a training protocol that will not only target the pain symptoms or pain-related symptoms, but also everything else that the client is describing. What I've noticed is that oftentimes there are um, related symptoms when clients come in with uh, chronic pain. There's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of uh, fear, right? What's going to happen to me? I have this pain. I can't work. I can't care for my family or for myself. Um, sometimes there's anger related to that. You know, why is it happening to me? Um, that sense of hopelessness, that despair, you know, sometimes depression is part of it as well. So we're looking into all of it. And as we target different parts of the brain, we will help alleviate not just the, the pain related symptoms, but all the other ones as well. So, so when someone comes into your office after you're done with the interview, what does it mean to do the neurofeedback? Okay, so what, doing? how do you set them up? Right. What are they so looking at? Once we have the intake part taken care of, there's some uh, measurement of, 
uh, brain performance uh, used as a before and after baseline uh, and after uh, measurement. And that is, it's a simple uh, computerized standardized testing that we need to uh, have objective measurement of brain performance along with the subjective symptoms. So we have that as a baseline and then we start the actual training implementing the treatment plan that we came up with after the intake. So the, the treatment plan is all based on the specific uh, symptoms that the client described during the intake. And so we're gonna have four electrodes placed on the head, different areas. Mainly as we start, we're working on calming the nervous system down and then also stabilizing one or the other, or both depending on what kind of specific symptoms we're dealing with. And so we're collecting the, the signal, the electrical signal from that area that we're targeting. And then the computer will process that information and show it back to the brain through different, three different channels. It's the visuals that the client is looking at, and then we have auditory feedback and tactile feedback, all helping the brain see itself and understand what it's doing. Once the brain, has that information. So really the client doesn't have to do anything else but be present and allow that information to come in. Um, they don't need to actively try to make anything happen uh, in this infralow range that we're working with. It's not about operant conditioning anymore. We're not telling the brain what to do, but we're simply allowing the brain to be a witness to what it's doing. And that's very much like us looking in the mirror and correcting our posture, right? So it's very much like that. Yeah. And, and so uh, the brain learns from that and the brain makes those corrections at a subconscious level. So the conscious mind is not involved. The conscious mind actually oftentimes is in the way because we're trying to control it, right? We've learned about control ever since we came into this world and we're trying very hard to be in control. The reality is that most of what the brain does is happening on a subconscious level and we have no clue that it's actually happening. And so just being a witness of your own, own brain's activity and us as clinicians trying to show the brain different parts of that signal, the brain responds to that in a more calming or a more activating way. And depending on what we're looking for, we're gonna search for this optimal uh, training setting that helps the brain be relax and helps the brain feel calm and helps the mind quiet down. So it's a balance, it's a nice balance between physical relaxation and mental calming. And we're not trying to push the brain into sedation. We're not trying to push the brain into, you know, agitation either. It's that happy middle that we're looking for. And that is very specific to each and every one of us. So it takes a few sessions to find that happy middle for each person. Once we have that, we can then target different parts of the brain to more specifically impact symptoms that we want to impact. So for instance, if we're working on physical pain, we would work in the back of the head, we would target the, the right hemisphere in the back. But if we're looking at emotional components related to pain, like hypervigilance and fear, for instance, then we would target the right prefrontal area right, prefrontal cortex. So then we develop this treatment plan, which would then include different um, sites, different areas. And then um, repetition is key. The brain needs time to learn how to function different, right? It functioned a certain way for a very long time. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and then what we're trying to do is reinforce new pathways that the brain can then learn to stay on outside of the training, right? What the client experiences in session is a shift of state, which can be anything from less anxiety to um, more alert, less alert, um, maybe less pain, maybe more pain. So things are shifting as the brain tries to figure out what's going on. Oftentimes what happens early in the training is an awareness, an increased awareness to what's going on inside us. Someone who experiences chronic pain on a daily basis will try very hard to disconnect from the, right, the brain tries to disconnect from the body so that it doesn't feel that pain that much. Well, when we put you back into your body, 
you're going to become more aware of what's going on. So it's not necessarily an increase in pain, but rather an increased awareness. And that regulates, right? So it just takes a little bit for the brain to figure out what's going on. Then it will regulate that awareness. And what I've seen with chronic pain patients is, is really interesting. So if we're talking about chronic nerve pain, for instance, chronic back, back pain, that kind of stuff, people come back and they won't talk about the level of pain necessarily when you ask for feedback, but they're gonna ask, they're gonna tell you about how they were able to do more despite the pain, which needs to be interpreted as an improvement because with the pain, right, what we're changing is the perception of it, the brain's perception of it, the brain, the brain's response to an alarm system that is continuously on, right? And so when that calms down, when that alarm is not sounding that loud, then the brain can do more, then that system together can do more, right? And we have a, a wide outreach in terms of what the brain can do once that alarm system is not as loud. Sleep improves, anxiety goes down, fear goes down, executive function improves, um, you know, their everyday life quality of their life improves. So that's really, really important. What's also important is the understanding that it's a process. It takes time. It's not a quick fix. And so people who do neurofeedback for chronic pain are prepared for that. We're starting and we're starting small and we're building up the protocol. And as the client improves, we're building step-by-step, step, right? We're building, we're building on that calming effect that we're getting. I noticed that a lot of times um, the chronic pain is rooted in trauma. And so maybe clients will, won't come in and tell you about their trauma and they don't even have to, you know, you can kind of figure that out as you go, as you talk about their symptoms. And what I've learned is that with the experience of trauma, developmental trauma, the brain shifts to emergency mode, which is something that we come into this world with. It's this fantastic feature that allows us to stay alive, right? To survive terrible situations. The problem is that sometimes the brain has a hard time switching back to normal mode. Okay, the danger is over. And now I can go back to my doing my own thing and you know just develop property. Well, any interference in early brain development can result in chronic dysregulations, not just chronic pain, but it can be chronic anxiety and chronic depression, chronic insomnia. I see that a lot as well. And sometimes, of course, they go together. Attachment issues that can then later on lead to chronic pain as well. And so when we're designing the training protocol, we, we take all of that into account. And we have to, after working on the physiological symptoms, we have to look into the deeper issues, right? The, the root of the problem. And that is a different kind of training, still neurofeedback, but not a wake state training like the one that I described, but rather deep state training that allows the brain to do some processing and allows that traumatic memory to be processed and put aside as a memory with no emotional attachment to it, right? And so that's the second part of the process where we help the brain heal from within so we work on symptoms and then we work from the inside out to allow that deeper healing as well. And then what we see is a huge improvement in symptoms and this just this feeling that the, the huge weight that was there is lifted. So it's a very interesting journey. It's, it's a wonderful journey to witness. Um, and you know, there's this misconception that maybe chronic pain occurs in, in older people, and that's not true. I've worked with athletes, I've worked with a teenage boy who had several sports injuries, and the last one he suffered from, he just didn't recover. The pain stayed, so the, the injury itself was gone six months later, but the pain was still there. The pain was a 10 out of 10 all the time. He couldn't put his foot down, he couldn't put a sock on, would walk with crutches, it was terrible. And we were able in the first three sessions to completely take the pain away. Now, Pretty good. <laughs> that was wonderful. Is so the brain responded really quickly to the training. But what was interesting was that we needed continuous trainings, so ongoing daily training 
to keep the pain away. And it took a long time. So he trained for about two years. And the last year was mostly, you know, sessions farther apart, so more like maintenance and spacing the sessions out to see how the brain does without it, without the training. Well, he was fine afterwards and went back at his goals. So that was his journey. It took a while, but he was pain free as long as he did the sessions in the beginning. So that was really, really interesting. Now, did you find that he had some underlying emotional trauma that was connected to that, that the pain yes. was that persistent? Absolutely. So there, there were some attachment issues, some issues in the family, the family dynamic, um, a very controlling uh, parenting style that I think uh, this kid was just not prepared for. His brain was much more sensitive and not ready for that. And I think the, the sports injury just revealed that, you know, it just gave the brain a chance to say, hey, this is not okay. This is not the, the good environment that I need. Um, but the fact that it recovered, you know, over time and the fact that he was able to resume sports, that's, I think that was wonderful for him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um can you talk about some other examples? I know there's no typical amount of sessions, but can you just say what range you've seen with chronic pain, the shortest um, and the longest you've seen? Because you said this person's two years. That's not typical in my experience that people need. No, like it's that. not. It's absolutely not typical. Um, but I think, again, it was a... a very special brain, we had a hard time implementing the full plan, the full treatment plan. So it turned out that we had to work a lot on calming his body down before we were able to touch any other part of his brain with the training. So it took a long time to develop the full treatment plan and get to the alpha theta to help with the attachment issues that he was dealing with. So yes, it's not typical. Um, you know, 20 sessions, which is what we typically do with most clients is, um, a good start. It's not going to be enough for chronic issues, whether we're talking about chronic pain or we're talking about uh, chronic anxiety, chronic depression. Why is it not enough? Because as I said, the brain needs all this repetition. It needs practice to learn how to stay on these new pathways. Um, but I would say closer to 40 to 60 sessions. That's what I see um, happening. Also, because the deep state training that I was talking about, so the second part of the training, uh, the deeper healing, um, it takes time to be able to implement that as well. So the brain needs preparation before it can go into this deeper state and actually process the, the stuff that's, you know, hiding underneath. So, um, I think that would be a more realistic number, 40, 60 sessions. And as I said, what I'm doing, because it's so individualized, I let the client lead. You know, if things go well and we can space the sessions out, we're gonna do that. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna do whatever makes sense for each client. We're gonna go back um, to training and do the maintenance maybe every once in a while, maybe do a booster of several sessions, whatever that brain needs, that's what we're gonna do. Mm -hmm. um, some people just come every once in a while, like once, twice a year for booster sessions, and they do well without that. Um, it's different depending on what kind of chronic pain we're dealing with. So in my experience, for instance, with uh, migraines and, um, you know, chronic migraines, chronic headaches, um, fibromyalgia, you need to train more in the beginning and um, actually allow the brain to reach that good balance that I was talking about and good stability. And what happens with uh, migraines, for instance, they change initially in frequency and intensity. And so the pace needs to be, the pace of the sessions, the, the training needs to be a little bit faster, sessions closer together to not allow the brain to slip back. Taking breaks early in the training with someone with fibromyalgia or migraines is not desirable because the brain seems to have a harder time getting back into it. So it's a little bit of a different approach, but then once we reach that, that status, and here I speak from my personal experience, I used to have migraines all the time, every day, um, medication barely touched it and touched them. And um, 
you know, I think I haven't trained in a while. I should, but I <laughs> uh, sometimes have a hard time finding the time to do it. But I think I haven't trained in about six months. I have not had any migraines, uh, not recently, not in years. Um, so the it's, brain learns it's... how to attain it, right? Is that what got you into doing neurofeedback? Were you first a patient with no, migraine? No, actually, actually, I learned about neurofeedback. I learned about the, the authors, and I went in and talked to Sue, and she was telling me about it. With my medical background, I was intrigued because here I was suffering from migraines, and I don't know, can this really be true? It sounds too good to be true. I'm sitting there in a chair and watching the rocket ship, and then the headache comes, and then it goes away doesn't, you know, on a conscious level, it doesn't make much sense. But then um, I got trained in it. And then I trained myself, of course, and I started working with clients, you know, 13 years ago, more than 13 years ago. Um, I got rid of my, my migraines early on. So it's like, you know, that was that was something that, that, you know, my personal story that gave me more confidence in working with any kind of chronic dysregulation. And so I think once the brain learns how to do it, you know, it's like riding the bike, you never forget, but you're gonna need uh, tune-ups because um, there's ongoing vulnerability, right? If your brain was wired a certain way, we're talking about migraines and fibromyalgia pain, where it's more about instability than emergency. Um, in that case, we, we have that vulnerability through all our lives. It's a genetic thing. Uh, and so we're not going to have an influence on that. We just can help the brain to become less easily triggered, right? More resilient. So could you talk about uh, someone you work with with fibromyalgia? Because I know that's very common and, you know, it can be very treatment resistant. Right. Yes, I have worked a lot with fibromyalgia, actually. And um, it's very interesting in my experience. And this category of clients is very different because their symptoms shift even without anything else changing, right? So even before you put the electrodes on and you start showing the brain what it's up to, there's a lot happening. And that can be overwhelming in terms of what to track, right? I was telling you in the beginning that our method really tracks symptoms, right? We're focusing on symptoms. Well, when you have 20 things happening before session and they all shift during session, as you're trying to optimize your settings and find what really works for that brain. What I find is that with this clientele, you need to uh, do less and let the brain sit with it. And when I say less, it's just less shifting. Show the brain one piece of information, let it learn from it and let it tell you what it needs afterwards. And so that's a better approach and it works better in the long run. So those nervous systems are so sensitive to everything and are so easily triggered that doing too much is just going to further confuse the matter uh, and even dysregulate them. So working step by step, I had this one uh, lady who came in and she had been suffering with fibromyalgia symptoms for a long time. She also had a history of trauma in her past. So we were focusing on both calming and stabilizing. And so um, it was interesting to see how, as we were working on the calming, the brain would become more destabilized and would, you know, I, I use this word, freak out because that's exactly what it was doing. And then we would stabilize and then it would settle down. And so over time, what we noticed was that um, it was really important to mostly stabilize for her. And so the calming came along later on and she saw improvement from session to session, but in session, it was very hard for her to tell me what was going on. So we had to wait and see. And it was really beautiful to see her improving from session to session uh, the reports would come in and it was still you know it's not gone it's still there but now I can do more and now you know the brain fog is uh, gone and I can't I, you know I'm not hopeless anymore I have this uh, hope that now things can shift to the better and we worked a lot we were we did probably more than 60 sessions it was uh, it was long-term training uh, over uh, I think more than a year but you know, in the end, when we stopped training, she was doing well. And, you know, when 
when we parted, I said, you know, the door is open. If you feel you need to come back in for tune-ups, you're always welcome to come in. Let me know. We can always go back and, and trade some more. So would you say she was relatively pain-free at the end? She it would experience long periods of, of no pain. And the other thing to consider too when, when working with chronic pain is that these people are on medication. And I was just gonna so, ask you about that. <laughs> <laughs> see, I can read your mind. Um, so medication is a big part of it, right? Uh, people need the medication and the force. We're grateful we have the medication. Medication is helpful in a crisis, but it's not solving the problem. It's masking the symptoms, it's not solving the problem. So if, we're, if we go into the training with that in mind, and we go into the training knowing that the brain will learn how to self-regulate and will need less of the medication eventually, you know, then it's beautiful to track that over time and to have the client work with their um, physician to adjust the medication that they're taking on. Uh, I remember a few years ago, I worked with someone with trigeminal neuralgia, which is chronic facial pain that resp responds poorly to medication. And she was really desperate. So um, she was on a huge amount of painkillers that were doing nothing. But, you know, she didn't want to get off of them because there was still hope. But what if, you know, it gets worse if I get off of the medication. So here she is, of course, with the with depression and anxiety and all these other symptoms and, and the terrible pain. Um, and it, it was just beautiful because she responded quickly to the training and the physician was intrigued because they hadn't heard about her feedback. And said, well, what is this and how does it work? And, uh, you know, how, how can it take the pain away? You know, this person is, is taking a huge amount of medication and that's not working. How is this able to help in any way? And it did help. And, you know, the pain would go away in session. And she was just so grateful. Um, we did about 40 sessions for her. And, you know, with, with this kind of pain, it comes and goes very much like migraines, right? Uh, migraine pain. And um, she was pain-free. Um, we stopped the training because she was pain-free. And again, you know, come back if the pain returns. The propensity is there. Um, this is also a genetic matter. So. Um, if you have that kind of trait, if you have that kind of genetic makeup, it's possible the brain will experience that symptom again. But, you know, we were able to take it away. So, that was that. so just out of curiosity, because doctors can be really tough. Um, did that doctor ever refer you anybody else? I don't think so. I yeah. So, you so know, either. it's it's so striking to me that even when you can demonstrate to physicians that you have something really valuable to offer that you can help patients that they can't, that you never see another one of their patients. And you know that, you know, like with primary care physicians, 40% of visits to primary care physicians are for pain. And, you know, they have this very limited toolkit and um, usually it doesn't work. <laughs> and they, yeah. still, they still do not refer even when they have patients who've been very successful. And then, you know, people wait, you know, one of the reasons I did the directory is because people don't know where to turn for information. And, right. you know, they wait for their doctors to say, why don't you try this? And, and it's never forthcoming. I think doctors want to, I don't know, hang, doctors don't like working with pain patients because they know they can't usually help them, but yeah. yet they won't you know, help them find other resources. So, you know, it's very frustrating. It is, it is, that's true. Um, I think it's all about uh, raising awareness. Um, you know, Sue and Siegfried Ogmer, who are pioneers in this uh, infraloner feedback field, um, they, they worked for 40 years to raise awareness and still, you know, barely made a dent in, yeah. <laughs> in it. So I think it's, it's our job, each and every one of us, to just educate people. Um, I think clients have gotten better, patients have gotten better in advocating for themselves and, and researching. And so what I find is that clients find me 
um, just because they, they Googled, you know, what else right. could I do for my symptoms? And then your feedback comes up because someone posted something about it. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm working really hard to raise that awareness. And I'm hoping that this discussion, you, you know, is going to reach a lot of people and will, will uh, at least um, have them reach out and, and do a free consult. And we can discuss how this can help them specifically. Um, because as I said, each brain is different. And what I what I would love to see is your feedback being one of the first um, treatments to try before other interventions are tried. Because what I find is when the brain is in fight or flight mode, it's very difficult for the, the mind, the conscious mind to receive anything else. It's not gonna pay attention. The brain needs to prioritize survival in our minds when there's chronic pain, which is a chronic, you know, alarm system, an ongoing alarm system in the brain, nothing else matters. Alarm, alarm, danger, danger. And so the brain can't prioritize anything else about survival. And so trying to do pop therapy, for instance, which is a wonderful tool, won't help in that state as much as it will help once the brain calms down. And then the therapy can bring other tools that can help with coping and can help with, you know, everything else that's, that needs to be helped um, with that client. So, yeah, you know, talking about the brain as an alarm system, you know, my belief, both with pain and with things like anxiety, is that if you medicate it, the brain is trying to tell you there's a problem. So it just ups the level. It happens with pain, it happens with anxiety. With anxiety, it's like the brain thinks you're in danger, you know? So you try to tamp down that alarm. You may not be in danger, but the brain thinks you're in danger, you know? So you take an anti-anxiety med or you take a pain med and the brain just ups the alarm, makes it louder. So I think a lot of people get stuck in that cycle. And, you know, as you said earlier, another problem with um, medication is that it doesn't get at the underlying problem. It okay. just tones down the alarm and sometimes not very well. True. So, you know, I think these mind body things are, you know, very helpful. And, you know, I haven't said it yet, but I'm also a neurofeedback practitioner who does a similar, who does the same kind of uh, neurofeedback. And, um, you know, I've seen it work really, really well. And like you, I get very frustrated when I see people and they've just been through you know, terrible things, you know, they've been through multiple surgeries to address their pain and it just made things worse and, or they've gotten addicted to pain meds or, you know, and there's so many, you know, not just their feedback. If you look at my alternative pain treatment directory, there's so many possibilities, you know, what's going to help any one person depends on what the underlying problem is, but, you know, so often it's a, you know, it's the brain on over arousal, it's brain instability, um, it's trauma that's stuck in the nervous system, you know, so all those things, neurofeedback can help. So um, have you worked with someone with CRPS, complex regional pain syndrome? Right, so that uh, teenage boy that I was telling you about was one of them. I had a gymnast that I worked with, uh, with CRPS and, what was interesting with her, um, the treatment was not as successful as I had hoped. Um, and she only did 20 sessions. Uh, they didn't want to continue because the results were not as encouraging as they had hoped. But what was interesting there um, was that this, this person, this young lady, um, she was a go-getter. She had this injury uh, that basically ended her career. And it was heartbreaking because she never allowed herself to acknowledge that and to feel what she was feeling. The, the grieve the loss. Not, right, not, not so much the chronic pain, but just the emotional pain that she was going through. And um, she wouldn't even talk about it. She would always smile and her mother would describe to me how she would go and help others, uh, you know, uh, train, the, the other girls train. So she wanted to be involved, but she never showed any, any of that emotional pain uh, that she, she had gone through. And so once we actually um, addressed the emotional regulation piece with the training, 
um, in session, nothing happened. But then after session, she went into the car and she started sobbing. And her mom said it was the first time. So that was a breakthrough. She said, you know, it's the first time that she actually lets down the guard and just allows those emotions to come. So, um, you know, I think it would have been absolutely beneficial to continue. Um, but I think she wasn't ready for it. I think maybe in this case, some therapy would have helped beforehand. And she was doing all sorts of uh, medical treatments that were not really successful either. But I think she needed something else before yeah. being ready to actually let everything out, you know, come to yeah, and that Yeah, that stuffing of feelings, and I know it well, because it's the way I was brought up. And, you know, I'm also a, you know, survivor of chronic pain. And, you know, just holding those feelings in, it's actually physiological when you do that and you create pain in your body by doing that and you stay stuck. Yeah. You know, so that emotional release, even though, you know, people, some people think of, you know, breaking down, sobbing is falling apart. It's actually a very healing thing to do. Yeah. Uh, researchers have actually found toxins from stress in your tears. So it's like you're getting an internal wash among other things. Right. So it's, um, you know, it's good, but people are, you know, they've been brought up to think it's not okay to cry or it's not okay to show your emotions. My father was a nice guy, you know, overall, but if I would cry, I would say, shut up or I'll give you something to cry about, you know? And I think a lot of people have heard that growing up and, um, and other things, you know, men aren't, obviously aren't supposed to cry. It means they're weak and, and all yeah. of that, but it's actually, you know, it's part of our natural, um, you know, tools for for dealing with stress and it is very helpful and um you know when you get that kind of emotional release when you're whatever kind of therapy you're doing you know i tell my clients never miss an opportunity to cry because it's it's helpful absolutely <laughs> people will be in my office crying and they'll be apologizing and i'm like no you know this is good <laughs> yeah yeah it's more of the healing it. process absolutely yeah. i find you know? that too yeah. So, you know, and I find occasionally when I'm working with people that they just give up too soon. And I know that if they had stuck with it, they would have gotten a lot of benefits. So on my end, that's very frustrating. Yeah. Oh, people. Yes, you do. I always tell people, you know, when they talk to me and they say, how long will it take? I say, well, you know, the rule of thumb is at least 20 sessions to get a significant benefit that will stick. If you step before 20, you're wasting your money because your brain won't be able to hold on to the change. Right. And, um, you know, so, you know, but it's, it's hard because, you know, we're a pill oriented society, even though they've taken pills and it hasn't worked. Sometimes people still want that instant result, but, you know, I know from my experience and I'm sure you do too, that if people stick with it, you know, the, the results are very good and there's a very high effectiveness rate. Right, right. Even, you know, when the injury is still there. So I, I'm working, for instance, with uh, clients who have uh, back pain due to a bulging disc. And of course, we're not going to fix the, the bulging disc with our feedback. But what changes, again, is the perception of pain. Um, so what the, the body does, it tenses up, right, around the injury to try and, and tell you that something's wrong. Well, we can help with that muscle tension. We can help with that muscle pain. And that brings a lot of relief. So there are ways in which we can help that, you know, are sometimes unexpected, you know, working with uh, sciatica pain, for instance. That goes away in session within minutes. I've seen that going away. and it's just a matter of doing it more and more. Of course, if there's a pinched nerve, we're not going to fix that. Right. But but we help. And a the, lot of times, system. a lot of times, that whole issue of uh, abnormal discs is um, it's not the cause of the pain. MRI studies very early on in the '90s, you know, when they first came out with MRIs, they found mm -hmm. that people who were getting MRIs for reasons other than pain would show degenerative disc, bulging disc, herniated disc, but they had no pain. And mm -hmm. it's so common that by the time you get older, 
90% of people have disc issues, but most of them don't have pain. So there's a lot of people who question, does it really have anything to do with pain? Right. But you know, you tell a patient, oh, you have these disc issues and they feel like they're damaged and that they can't get better. And then they worry about movement causing injury and things like that. And then, you know, they're in a very bad state just because they think, you know, I'm damaged. And right. I have to live with this. And usually it's not even related to the pain. It just happens to be there. And the real issue is muscle tension. Yeah, yeah. Muscle yeah. And, 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 like and I think it's it's also so much about how you think about chronic pain, how, how, you, how you frame it. You know, if you think about it as something that the brain does to help you, if you embrace it as such, it's much easier than to look at it as being the enemy, right? Being the bad thing. So that that in itself, that whole approach, you know, that perspective can help, and then it can it can aid in the healing as well. Yeah. yeah. So you know that sounds pretty good. <laughs> it sounds like you've done a lot of good work, and um, I appreciate your being here and and. Um, educating people about it. Uh, can you tell people how to get in touch with you if they'd like to, um, sure. like to find out more about what you do or make an appointment? So they can find me on uh, my website. Uh, it's neurotopia.net um, or uh, email Roxana, R-O-X-A-N-A -A, at neurotopia.net. And there's a phone number as well, 818 uh, 6202655. You can find me on the directory, uh, on the pain directory. Um, I'm listed there. I'm here to help. Just reach out for a free consultation. We can just discuss over the phone in a bit virtual meeting. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to helping more people. Yeah, I hope you do too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Cindy. <laughs> and I just love that, that word, neurotopia. Yes. You know, a combination of neurofeedback and utopia. <laughs> yeah. There's a better brain out there. There's a better version yeah. of your brain out there. Just yeah. Need to look for yeah. It. <laughs> right. Right. So thank you again. And thank you, Cindy. Um, and uh, we'll talk again. We'll do. Thank Have you. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Bye.